Hello and welcome to the Capes and Lunatics. It's another book club. The one you've been waiting for, we've been promising for the last three episodes that uh, we would talk to the author of the Laura Cunningham series and... He's, tonight he's here, ladies and gentlemen, Will Hellfire to put up with two characters tonight. Uh, everyone welcome Mr. John Parrish. Hello, uh, thank you for having me, Phil and Lilith both. It's uh, it's great to be here. All right, let me cut that off. All right, uh, but yeah, we've been chomping at the bit to uh, talk to a real live author. Oh, fantastic. Well, happy to... Happy to uh, indulge. I mean, I've been I've been excited about uh, about y'all covering the the books on the previous episode. So I, I'm happy to you know just just chat whatever. Let's get to it. Uh, Will, do you want to start so people don't accuse me of nepotism once again? No, no, no. you're the one that has to do <laughs> for Thanksgiving. I'm assuming maybe. So I'll like, <laughs> set the tone. Uh, all right. Uh. Well, you'd be surprised what I don't know. Uh, all right. So I always try to start at the beginning. When did you know you wanted to write? Oh, uh, I actually I actually fielded this one for uh, for another podcast a little while ago, so it's good. So I have this front of mind. So I I had always been, you know, just sort of I, I guess from a while back, like when I was like kindergarten, first grade, you know, I was always writing. I was always like, you know, just jotting stuff down. And it was always, it was always something interesting, but uh, you know, it wasn't, it, it wasn't really a calling. Like I didn't know for sure that's what I was going to do with my life. And then in fourth grade, I remember this very distinctly in fourth grade, uh, we had, you know, an English class and there was this, uh, this weekly, this weekly journal entry assignment. It was essentially like free writing. They would give you a, uh, the teacher would give you a sort of like creative writing topic and you had to like write, you know, two to three pages of a journal entry, like essentially like a, a made up story based on this entry uh, and then read it aloud to, uh, to the class. And the first one I wrote was, was kind of okay. Uh, and then like the, the day before we're supposed to turn it in, I'm sitting next to this, this kid in my homeroom, uh, Jordy Russell. I remember the kid's name. He was a complete jackass. Uh, and he had his assignment open and I happened, I happened to glance at it and it was, it was friggin' hysterical. And it had never occurred to me that, Oh wait, this is a school assignment, but I can be creative while writing about it. I can, I can make, make stuff up and be, you know, and have fun with it. Like, you know, really just sort of let my imagination run. Uh, so the first week, whatever, kind of, kind of a knockoff. The second week I got a little creative and for the reading aloud portion, like the kids in class just ate it up with both hands. It was like, Oh my God, this is hysterical. So like the third week I, I turned it up a little further and the fourth week and it, it got, it got a little ridiculous at the time. Like the kid, like the, the teacher had to, and this is, this is a ridiculous thing to brag about, you know, it's fourth grade, but like. The, the teacher had to be like, all right, we can't read John's right away. We've got to let some other people read first before we bring him on. So long story short, anything that like people get that psyched about in fourth grade is pretty much going to dictate what you want to do for the rest of your life. Like that, that, that swelled my head pretty big from an early age. So like that, that was an ego trip I had a long time to come down from. Uh, so a very long answer to that question, but that's, that's where that came from. Yeah, I agree with the whole fourth grade thing. Unfortunately, it was just comics for me. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you laugh, Lilith? I know, I know what. Same here, same here. I know here. what you're into. Some of the things we can't mention here, but <laughs> well, it was rated teen, but that's not what we're here to talk about today. When did you know that this story was going to be a trilogy? Did you set out initially to make the story like not just a one-off, or? Uh, well, that's a, that's, that's a complicated one. Uh, initially, no, initially it was just the one idea. So the way this one came to me is I was, I was writing, you know, various manuscripts. I was, and I was reading a lot of thrillers at the time as well. A lot of stuff in the same genre. And I'm just bouncing ideas once, you know, you know, one day off the top of my head. And I'm like, all right, what, what are ideas that really like really speak to me? And I'm thinking, well, okay, there's the, there's a story of like, 
a guy loses his family and goes on a, you know, goes on a, a rampage for revenge. Like, you know, this whole mystery investigation revenge thing. It's like, okay, that's kind of been done. That's like a cliched story. It's like, all right, what else do we got? It's like, well, what if we just flip it? So it's like, what if a woman loses her family and goes on like a mystery, you know, an investigation uh, quest for revenge? Like, okay, but that just kind of flips the, that just kind of flips the genders. That doesn't really do anything new with the story. So I'm like, okay, how can we make it like, how can we really turn this on its head? It's like, all right, what if a man loses his family and a, and a, and someone completely unrelated, like a woman goes on a rampage for revenge. I'm like, well, why, why would she be involved with it? It's like, okay, maybe, maybe she's sleeping with him. Maybe she's sleeping with a married man. And then that led me to start thinking, and already I'm starting to turn this over in my head kind of curiosity. All right. So what sort of person has an affair with a married man and yet, when his family gets killed, like, decides that she has to, like, take things into her own hands, decides that she has to bring justice. Because those are two very conflicting, but also kind of complementary character traits that, you know, willingness to make bad choices, and yet, you know, that, that pursuit of justice, that, that independence. And it was when I had those two traits in mind that the character of Mara Cunningham started coming to life. So once I had that, I was like, okay, that's a story to build around. And then once I once I realized the depth of the character, I was like, well, this doesn't have to be the end of the story. Like she's she's got enough motivations and enough things going on with her that that we could probably keep going. So it was after I finished the first one, I was like, well, okay, we, we've learned about her, but we haven't really learned about the other people in her life, like her family. And that's where the second one came from, the backstory with her, uh, with her brother. Um, and then in the third one, I wanted to revisit some of the characters I'd introduced in the first one and, uh, and just heighten things there. So really, that's, that's how, it, how it turned into, into the three books that it is so far. You answer my question of why did you go with the female protagonist? So, <laughs> okay. Yeah, I mean that. <laughs> I mean that was that was really it. I wanted to. I, I wanted to take. I wanted to take what was kind of a, kind of a, a, a cliched idea or kind of a very recognizable idea and twist it as much as I could and still find something plausible enough to build a story on. And that's that's where that came from. Or or. Uh... Well, we got you've you've written three books with this character. Are you going to do any more? Do you... uh, I've been thinking about it. So since since the third one came out, I've I set I set her aside as a character, and I worked on I've worked on other manuscripts. Uh, I'm I'm deep I'm deep in one right now that's also a crime thriller, also set in Boston, but with a different set of characters, and I feel really good about this one. But I do I do have just the the vague tenuous outline of what would be the fourth and probably final Mara Cunningham book mm -hmm. I just need to at some point uh, I just need at some point put it together like I'm, I'm excited about the stuff I'm the other stuff I'm doing currently but I I know that if I want to come back to it it's it's out there and all right why Boston I know you've lived there for many years now but that's not yeah. where you grew up it's like do you do you love the city or you're or are you just I'm <laughs> familiar with it because I've lived here for so long now uh it's it's both definitely uh I mean I I really do like the city as as Phil alludes to I grew up in Baltimore uh or just outside Baltimore yeah so I I have I have that as as history and backstory but um uh, I mean, for one thing, the the HBO series The Wire kind of covered Baltimore really heavily, so it's like that's really, really well <laughs> well trod ground at this point. Uh, Boston, I feel like I know, uh, and there's also that sort of like interesting character to it. Like Boston, you know, Boston as a real city is not as corrupt as I depict it to be in the novels, but there is that level of, you know. Uh, yeah, not quite corruption, but like intertwined influence between these these different spheres, like you know, private industry and and the the public sector, and you know, a little bit of the mob background and and journalism declining, and all these things uh, that you know, if I take them and I just crank them to eleven, I have something to build a novel around. Uh, so 
yeah, there was enough there was enough there that I, I felt I could heighten it enough and make it plausible and believable and that it would work as a story. And also just just love of the city. I, I, I really do I really do like Boston. It's got this, you know, kind of kind of towny charm for as much of a, a world class city as it as it thinks it is. Lilith, have anything? Oh yeah. Why make her a redhead? <laughs> uh I <laughs> uh well I, I knew she was I knew she was gonna be Irish. Uh I knew she was gonna be very much like Boston, towny, working class neighborhood, uh, you know, Irish. Uh and once once I went there, like it it seemed easy enough to just go ahead and make her an actual red head with uh, you know there's there's the implication of you know being redheaded being you know quick quick tempered uh impulsive etc and i i hope i'm not being i hope i'm not being too unfair with that i i haven't i haven't had any complaints from the the few redheads i know who've read the novel none of them have have uh brought, held it against me so <laughs> I, I love a redhead protagonist i do so. yeah Oh yeah. yeah, I mean she is she is uh she is hardcore towny Irish uh through and through. So yeah, she's uh, she's about as legit as it's gonna come. Yeah. All right, here's a weird question. I'm sure you wouldn't mind if like Netflix or Hulu like picked this picked up the series for like, <laughs> TV show, correct? <laughs> no, I would not I would not object. I would not turn down that money. I didn't think so. But like who who what famous actress could you see playing the lead role? Uh so this is this has changed. Uh at the uh, at the time, like when I was writing the the first book, um, and I don't know how she'd look as a redhead because she's not naturally a redhead. Uh, I had uh, I had Elizabeth Moss in mind as Mara, uh, Elizabeth Moss of uh, uh, The Handmaid's Tale, Top of the Lake, and uh, and and a couple other series. Uh, I, I think I think her her star has risen to the point that she might be she might be out of my budget at this point. Uh, but I, I think I think especially in especially in Top of the Lake and especially in her latter seasons on Mad Men, uh, she definitely plays that that character who's who's not afraid to speak her mind, who's not afraid to start fights, uh, and who occasionally makes you know impulsive choices, occasionally makes bad choices, but doesn't uh, doesn't beat herself up over them. Like she doesn't that you know she doesn't consider them baggage. Uh, that's why I had mine for her. Uh, I'm trying to think, uh, actually, uh, yes, in the, in the second book. And again, this isn't really a casting choice. It's just sort of who I had in mind when I was writing it. So I, I, I guess it sort of flavored the, uh, flavored the perception of the character. Uh, but if you've, if you've seen the, the Ben Affleck movie, the town, uh, Jeremy Renner in there does a very convincing uh, Charlestown like slash towny Boston bro, and I, I sort of unwittingly kept coming back to him when I was writing uh, Mara's brother uh, in that book, uh, Jimmy Cunningham, because uh, he's very much that he's he's very much that character in Spades, the short tempered, chip on his shoulder, immediately jumping to a fight, uh, that sort of that sort of impulsive character. Uh, that's definitely who I had in mind there. You know who I thought of though? It's Mark Wahlberg from um, Ted. Is like when I picture that, that <laughs> guy. <laughs> Just a little bit, but Jeremy Renner is a good one too. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, uh, I mean Wahlberg is uh, Wahlberg is uh, Dorchester through and through. Yeah, he's uh, yeah, he he grew up in he grew up in those same neighborhoods. He's he's not too far removed from that from that character type. So. Uh, yeah, I mean, if he were actually, yeah, by the by the time of the book, by the by the time of the second book, Jimmy would be in his uh, early forties. So, I mean, it's not it's not out of range for uh, for Maki Mock. He could uh, he could make it work. No, Ben Affleck, because he's about to leave his job soon. <laughs> Ben's uh, Ben's a little he's a little too old and he's a little too pretty for that sort of thing. <laughs> Maybe uh, all of the you know he'll have some contingencies and stuff. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> He's uh, yeah. He's he's uh. Oh God, he's Ben Affleck. Oh, he's 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 too pretty for us. I'm sorry. He's uh, he's too clean cut. Uh, 
So, so um, I, oh, good little. Oh, do you write full time or do you do something else? Oh no, this is this is not a full time job. Uh, very, very few uh, writers, even even the even the successful and popular ones, very, uh, very few writers can do this or can do like the fiction writing as a full time job. I mean, they'll often have some other form of writing to support it, or they'll be teaching. Uh, in my my day job, I work at a business school. Uh, I work in marketing and. Yeah, it's, I mean, the, the publishing industry had, I mean, it's, it, this has largely been the case, but it's, it's been more so in the last couple of years, the publishing industry has changed enough that, I mean, the, the money, the money just isn't there to support as many writers free time as there are books on the shelves. Uh, yeah, it's, it, and I mean, which it, it would be, it would be nice if it could support me full time, but I've, I've never, I'm, I'm not really holding out for that yet. I'm, I'm content with, with being able to set my own pace. And I know you said you have an outline for another story, but um, do you love this genre? Is this the only kind of genre <laughs> you want to write in or would you think about something else like science fiction or. I really do. I really do like the genre. Uh, I've, I've read enough of it that it's a, it's a sort of language and style that I can very easily slip back into. So that's, that's part of why I like it. Um, uh, the only other stuff I've tried my hand at is, uh, is fantasy writing just because, and part of the motivation is I, I read, uh, uh, not a lot, like a, a reasonable amount of, of fantasy literature. And also just cause a lot of my friends read fantasy novels and I kind of want to write something that I know they would read. Um, mm -hmm. uh, cause you know, this, I mean, this, this stuff, this stuff does well enough, but like, they're not, they're not all big crime thriller readers, whereas they'll just, they'll just vacuum up fantasy novels. So I figure I have a better chance of getting in front of them. If I, if I put something in their genre, uh, I, I've, I've tried that. I had last, so last year in the beginning of this year, I went through about five or six drafts of a, of a fantasy novel, uh, that I, I feel pretty happy with, but I, I did some more revisions and re-outlining of a couple months ago. And like, I, I want to take another stab at it before I tried selling it or publishing it again. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's in theory on the back burner, but, uh, but not anytime soon. Wait, did I just say in theory on the back burner? Uh, uh Jesus. <laughs> That's an awesome uh, for you. <laughs> yeah, La ladies and gentlemen, he he writes for he writes for uh, for a living. He writes for uh, for money. Yeah, oh, that's first draft. First draft. <laughs> that's the first draft. Yeah, definitely, it's the first draft. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. So, did um, any of the ladies in your life have a uh, any influence on the main protagonist in the series? <laughs> <laughs> what to admit to? Oh, <laughs> uh, that's always a tough one. Uh my. So not not Mara not Mara as such. Uh, my and and my my wife actually asked this at one point. And I tell her, no, you're you're not a character in any of these books. I promise, because uh, that would that would just that would just make things. I don't know. I I, I don't know if I could handle that. Uh, the so there's no one particular person that's that's Mara, but the one thing I've admired the most about. Uh, about a lot of the female friends I have is uh, just—I I mean, to put it to put it kind of bluntly, uh, owning owning up to the times that, like, owning up to being a mess sometimes. Like they don't they don't feel put upon to uh, they don't feel put upon to apologize their whole lives for bad choices they made. Uh, they they don't they don't feel that they don't feel that mistakes like this are they don't feel that mistakes uh, are necessarily limiting them or defining their character or something that are going to traumatize them for the rest of their life. They'll be like, "Yep, uh, I made a I made a bad choice. Uh, that's kind of who I am. I'm gonna I'm gonna apologize for it. I'm gonna do the best I can with it. But you know, this is this is who I am. This is the whole package. Take it or leave it. Uh, and that sort of that sort of unapologetic owning of one's own faults. That was the kind of character that I wanted to celebrate and valorize with with Mara, you know, the kind of person who who knows she's not perfect uh, and doesn't doesn't feel that she has to apologize for it. So you weren't nervous about having your female protagonist be the kind of woman that sleeps with a married man. 
<laughs> no. Uh, well, A, because none of my, or if any, if any of my friends have done that, they haven't told me about it. So I wasn't worried about them coming to me and being like, why, why are you putting my business in the street? <laughs> like, no, it's not you. I swear. Uh, no, I think most of the people who've read that, uh, men and women, uh, have been sort of have been sort of interested in that as a take. It's like, huh, okay, like that's not for most readers, that's not an instant turnoff. Like they don't see her as the villain just because she is, I mean, almost literally a home wrecker in this case. Uh, they see her as okay, like she's she's making interesting choices, she's making bad choices, but like, you know, they they sympathize with someone. I, I think. I think if you give if you give readers enough space and if you portray them right way, right, they'll sympathize with someone who makes a mistake. I think I think readers want to see people, you know, climb back from that and redeem themselves. I think it really grounds it in like realism and it makes her like a real person. I mean, if you make her too much of a perfect character, it it makes the syndrome a lot of it sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's that's what I. That, that's sort of what I, I keep coming back to in, in the other things I work on is, you know, and I, I think it's a it's a trope of, you know, crime thrillers as a genre of, of noir in particular, which this isn't exactly. But, you know, we're all sort of grown out of the, the noir genre at this point. It's uh, imperfect people in a in a worse world. It's like, you know, people who are people who are, are maybe a little shop worn or maybe a little bad who are dealing with people much worse than themselves and navigating the, navigating the, the very narrow range between those two. Well, isn't that like, a, is, isn't that like a better protagonist or hero, the person who doing good and being good doesn't come as easy as other people? Yeah, I, I, I certainly, I certainly think so. I, cer- I certainly hope so. I, I think we all have, you know, various, various baggage or various various hang-ups that keep us from doing the right thing that we want to do at all times and i i think being able to accept oneself and plow forward regardless is you know in, a, in an in an existential sense you know a certain a certain kind of heroic attitude uh, and I, I think it's it's something we we want to see the list do you have anything else Yes, I do, of course. And this is just a little personal. So it's still not is he the only one that likes the books in the family. Wait, what? Sorry, one more time. Is Phil the only is he the odd duck out? Is he the only one obsessed with comic books or uh, oh meaning meaning am I? Uh so I'm I'm not a I'm not obsessed. I, I do not have I do not have Phil's level of investment. Uh I mean I've I've read and, and followed them. Uh, I've read and followed them since uh, since I was a kid. Um, uh, so, I mean, I'm, I'm always, I'm always sort of up to speed on like the general trends of, of the industry. Like, um, uh, like I, I, I knew, I, I knew I'll, I'll know like what the big industry events are, like when civil war, when the new 52, when, when all, uh, when house of M and if, God, this is like a decade ago at this point. So I'm kind of dating myself. Uh, but like when, when those big events went down, I, I knew what was happening in the, broad storylines but i wasn't collecting uh i wasn't collecting monthlies uh I, w- I wasn't always up to speed so i mean i i'm, I'm familiar enough uh i i share his uh, i share his his passion for batman and the whole batman universe uh i i think that's that's the obvious one. Oh, that's another big dc fan sitting right over there oh that's there that. we go <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I see you comment on social media about like the movie, like when the movies come out and stuff. Like, what's what in your opinion? What's like the best one that's come out in the last few years, either from Marvel or DC? Uh, so I mean, I, I was just raving. I was just raving about this one recently. Uh, I saw Thor Ragnarok uh, the weekend it came out. Uh, both both my wife and I did, and we we loved it. Like, I I I can't think of the last time I was like laughing with delight at a movie on screen like for the first 20 minutes solid it was it was just like that it was just so i mean it not just the humor obviously because the humor was great but the sort of like you know jack kirby style you know big weird sci-fi structure and just the whole boisterous you know rollicking classic thor attitude it was just it was just so much fun Uh, i had a lot of fun with that i've uh I mean, yeah, I've had I've had fun with with most of the Marvel movies. Uh, 
the the D the DC stuff has been a little has been a little heavy for me. Uh, like especially the like especially the most recent ones, like uh, Batman v Superman, and based on the notes, I mean, obviously Justice League hasn't hasn't actually hit yet. Uh, I, I I worry that they're they're throwing a lot in awfully fast, uh, and I, I think if they had a little more room for the characters to breathe, there'd be a little more potential there. Uh, so I, I've had a harder time latching on to the uh, latching on to the new DC film series. Uh, but the TV series uh, in the current DC generation have been, you know, have been top notch by by everyone's acclaim. Yeah, we love the Flash here. Yes. Oh yeah. <laughs> and it's actually got kind of a, a, a more classic Flash and a little bit of noir now that we've got Ralph Den- uh, Ralph in there now. You know, Ralph Denton, yeah. Yeah. So I like it. <laughs> there we go. Cool. Cool. So. Oh. Well, oh, you love the TV shows. Uh, if anyone's listening, would you lo- would you love to? Uh, would you write for one of the shows? <laughs> uh, let me see. What could I? Uh, you know, I am I am kind of interested in where they're going to take Gotham. Uh, just because, I mean, I I was worried at first, like, oh, they've kind of locked themselves in with Bruce Wayne being so young, because now it's going to take years for him to grow up, and like, what are they going to do in the meantime? But they've been they've been taking in interesting directions, and like really exploring like the the depth of the the rogues gallery and the characters surrounding him and, and sort of building a universe around that it's like oh okay this is this is kind of interesting what they're doing so i i i think if we're looking for something that that i would be bet that i would be best able to contribute to touch wood you know ho- hollywood if you're listening uh it would probably be something along the lines of gotham hmm. yeah i could see that so you like weird yeah, stuff, huh? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Gotham's plenty weird. Either that or, I mean, uh, so it's it's coming out. I, I don't know when this episode will be released, but like this coming weekend, based on when we're recording now, uh, the new Netflix Punisher series yes. is coming out. Uh, and that one, that one looks, that one looks good. I mean, it looks, it looks really grim. I mean, but it's the Punisher. So it's going to be really grim, obviously. Uh, but I'm, like the 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 last run, not the last run of the Punisher. Uh, God, when uh, when the, when Marvel had their uh, pun their Max imprint, uh, Garth Ennis was still writing, but it was a different uh, different artist. It wasn't Matt, it wasn't Dylan. Uh, when they had that, I I have most of those in the uh, in the collection on my uh, on my shelf behind me. Uh, so yeah, that uh, that I'm interested to see how they do, and John Bernthal, just him in particular, like everything I've I've seen him in recently. Uh, he I I turned on uh, the Accountant the other day, that Ben Affleck thriller from earlier in the year, uh, and I was I was surprised to see John Bernthal in. I I didn't know he was going to be in that, and of course he was he was just phenomenal there. Uh, he had like the, the briefest of roles in the Simon Pegg movie Baby Driver, and he was just fun there. Uh, he's just. He's just good in whatever he does. I'm I'm glad he's getting work, uh, and I'm excited to see what he does as as the Punisher with with full reign. Oh yeah! After watching him on Walking Dead, I was like, oh yeah, he's gonna make a great Punisher. Yeah, yeah, good times. All right, Will, if you had to throw shade at me. Do you have anything else? <laughs> no, I just had to poke the bear. Sorry. Ah, uh, you're lucky you're not here and you're hungover. <laughs> So you want to let our guests do his shameless plugs? Yes. Uh, uh, any social media you want to plug or uh, tell people where to find the, find the books. Sure. So the, the books, as, as you know, from, from following the, from following the, the uh, podcast so far, uh, too close to miss is the first book in the series, too hard to handle and uh, too late to run for books two and three. You can find them on, uh, on Amazon, Barnes and Noble. Uh, and I, I think a number of other, I think a number of other online retailers. I, I honestly lose track at this point. Uh, those are going to be the two big ones. Those are the two easiest to find. Uh, you know, order your electronic or paperback copies. I, either will work. Uh, you can follow me. Uh, easiest way to follow me on Twitter uh, is probably on Twitter, just at Perich, P-E-R-I-C-H. Uh, sorry, Phil. I, I, I took the name. Uh, I, I took the, the last name first. Uh, uh, but yeah, at Perich uh, is the easiest way to, to keep up with me on social media. 
uh, I'll, yeah, I'll be I'll be talking about this recording, obviously. And as I as I get more into uh, as I get more into my my next project and and the next Mara, Mara Cunningham book, whenever it does whenever it does get released, uh, that's the easiest way to follow me. Uh, I do also have a I do also have a a John Parrish uh, author page on Facebook, but I haven't updated it terribly recently, just because nothing new has come out fairly recent uh, in a while. Uh, but any anything I I do update will be going there as well. All right. Uh, cool. All right. So th thank you very much for uh, joining us. Yes. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Uh, it's it's been great. It's been great talking about it. I've uh, I, 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 as I said, I've been excited to uh, to hear y'all uh, talking about the books and uh, and I, I hope you. Uh, I hope it's been uh, been a good conversation for you as well. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> oh yes, da, da. Thank you. Have a good night. All right. Take care. Too. Well, what are you laughing at over there? Just a good time on a Wednesday night, man. It's making fun of me. I know. Just I one dab. I love how like every episode we talk like you know like comics or like you know the Flash TV show. But me, the second someone else gets on here, you're just like, oh, do you like comics? Like Phil does. I'm like, <laughs> I'm well, I mean, I'm like that one of the only people in my family, so that's all I wanted I, to know. Oh, I know, I know. That's like I that there was there's him. I had a couple friends in school, but I'm like I never I've. I would never knew anyone really heavy into it until I met you and Tyler and the professor. And oh, that was a great talk. I we're we're gonna hunt him down until the fourth one. We're just gonna like, hey, when's that book coming out? Exactly. <laughs> she never gave us the Twitter. <laughs> you heard you heard a mad parrot on Twitter. Uh, pressure him for a fourth book. We need resolution. <laughs> And if you're an author and you want uh, free publicity and you're willing to talk to us, hey, we'll read your book and we'll, you know, we can talk to you too. Capes and Lunatics want you. Oh, we need a poster. <laughs> Press Charlie up like Uncle Sam. We volunteer Charlie <gasps> for a lot of stuff when he's not around, don't we? <laughs> oh, he loves it. He loves the attention. Uncle, <gasps> Uncle Professor wants you for the Capes and <laughs> No, that has to happen. Yes, it does. Charlie Lilith demands it. All right, so should we get out of here? Yeah, what? Do we know what book we're going to talk about next? Uh, no. If Maybe that was... Supergirl book? Uh... When does flash... that come out? There's a Flash what? and Supergirl book. I don't know. Are they out now? Is it a crossover? Or... I don't know if it's a crossover. I think they're just from the from the same publisher, I guess. Okay. But they're different authors, different. I don't know. If you have any suggestions, uh, email us capesandlunatics at gmail.com or call 614-382-2737-614-38 capes and leave us a suggestion. There's a book I just picked up, actually. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you guys can probably can't see it yet. The Leaving? Yep. I haven't read it yet. I heard good things. I was at, a, I happened to be at Books A Million and I was like, why not? It was like $9. <coughs> It's not a hard pack notice. She sent in a message to her boyfriend. She's got a new job out of the country. She's re reading a book called The Leaving. It has an interesting premise, so maybe. It's by uh, Tara Altabrando. Hmm. So if you read that book, tweet us. Leave us a note on Facebook or the voicemail. And say, yes, you must discuss this. Pressure filling is spending nine more dollars that takes away from comics. <laughs> But uh, yeah, we'll we'll figure out something. We'll the the book club will continue eventually. <laughs> I like yeah, but yeah, we love talking to writers. So uh, you don't even have to be related to me. You know, come on. All kinds of writers, TV writers, movie writers. <laughs> exactly, we do it all in the Capes and Lunatics. Comic book writers, music writer, even heck. Exactly. Is we Tom mean, Jones still alive? Because if he is, maybe. We can... <laughs> I don't. I think so, isn't he? I think so. 2016 was a rough year on celebrities. I, I still don't know. Dave Grohl, we want to talk to you. <laughs> you know what? Imagine Dragons. 
Tell us about writing that Spider-Man musical <laughs> that you turned into your first album. Wait, wait, what? We had this conversation. The Spider-Man musical, wasn't that you too? No, that was Imagine Dragons. Spider-Man Turn Off the Dark? I thought that was you too. Mm-mm. No? No, the second one. The second one that they tried to do. Oh, they did a second one? Yeah, the most recent one. Oh, okay. I thought after everyone started dying in the first one, <laughs> literally falling. Okay. <sighs> That's a random nonsense leading to <clears throat> Wade's world. Okay. Uh, should we get out of here? Definitely. Give All them right. the plugs. <laughs> I thought I already did. Uh, like I said, if you want to uh, recommend a book or if you've written a book and you want to talk to us or anything for any of the Capes and Lunatics shows, Capes and Lunatics at gmail.com. Voicemail 614 382 2737. That's 614 38 Capes. And follow us on Facebook, facebook.com slash Capes and Lunatics. Twitter at Capes Lunatics. Uh, Instagram, Pinterest, uh, yada yada. Bye, uh, <laughs> if you want that, uh, if you want to do an interview and you want that close uh, personal connection, you can always email me, nightwingpdp at gmail.com. And on Twitter, I am at Nightwing PDP and Lilith Hellfire. Um, you guys can just find me at Lilith Hellfire or Adventures in FG for right now. Check out my website, adventuresinfangirling.com while you still can. Come back Saturday or no. When are we doing Justice League? It's yeah, fun. Saturday Saturday night, uh, 7 p.m. Eastern live. You can watch me and Lilith and probably Tyler. Uh, dissect we Justice allowed League. Charlie to bow out of this one. So that means whatever move after Black Panther, I don't have to be here for somehow. But uh, I believe Friday at seven, me and Charlie are doing super connectivity. We'll probably start talking about however much of Punisher we've watched since then, probably like the first episode or so. Nice. It'll be a great way to wash out your mouth from Inhumans. If anything that would wash your mouth out from that. So yeah, Friday, 7 p.m., super connectivity. Saturday at seven, Justice League. So. All right, is that it? Mm-hmm. All right. This has been your Capes and Lunatics book club. Better than Oprah's. Hello. What? I was thinking, I was listening to our last Capes and Lunatics. Uh, you should change your Twitter handle to uh, at Lil Hellfire, L I L. <laughs> oh, that's actually the artist woman was named Lil Hellfire. That would be hilarious. Keep your eye on her. She was a rapper, a little, little, little hellfire back in the day. She, she, she was our Cardi B. Making a comeback. She was our Cardi B. And she will be again. I'm sorry, with uh, that. Hey, you know about Cardi B. <laughs> what you say? What do you know about Cardi B? I don't even know Cardi B. <laughs> She's been on the television and other things. We're a mess. Good night. Good night.